This morning's message is entitled, God's Gracious Invitation. God's Gracious Invitation. This is a passage that, again, reminds us of the character of God. That's why we come together every week, is to is to look at Scripture together and be reminded of who God is and what He's like. And you see this morning that He uh, He is kind, He's generous, He's gracious, and this passage highlights that in some powerful ways. So read with me Matthew 22, and we're going to be going through verse 14. So verses 1 to 14, all right? And Jesus gives another parable here. It says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes, and he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So here's another parable Jesus shares with the religious leaders. He's going back and forth with them. As I mentioned last week, from chapters 21 on to the end of chapter 23, that's what's happening, is Jesus interacting with the religious leaders and usually the way that it played out was like this. Jesus would be teaching his disciples or teaching the crowds, ministering to people, and the religious leaders would be watching him, sometimes from a safe distance, but uh, also at times they would kind of approach him and they would ask him questions or they'd question his authority or they would challenge him or try to trick him or trap him in some way. And that's what's happening in the context here. They've been opposing Christ and he is responding to them and oftentimes he responded to them in parables. Sometimes he responded in parables in order to conceal truth from them because of their pride. Other times he responded to them in parables in order to give them some familiar concepts to teach them about some unfamiliar concepts, to use images and experiences they had had to help them understand some greater, deeper things about God and his kingdom. And that seems to be the case here in Matthew 22. And there's this parable related to a kingdom who throws a party, basically, a wedding for his son. And so, first of all, I want us to look at this invitation and think about this for a minute. In verse 2, it says, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. So he is starting off with the concept of the kingdom of heaven, sometimes called the kingdom of God. And for clarification here, this is God's kingdom as opposed to, as an alternative to, the kingdom of man. So, kingdom of heaven over against the kingdom of earth, the kingdom of God over against the kingdom of man. And what the kingdom of man or the kingdom of earth is characterized by is is characterized by self-sovereignty. We talk about that a lot around here. Autonomy. I get to be in charge. That is really the essence of the kingdom of man is we all live in this world. However many people, I think 7 billion plus in our world right now, we live in this world thinking that we know best about things, that we, we, we sort of inherently instinctively trust our own viewpoint. We have lofty opinions. We, we believe we see things clearly. We are our own boss. We want to be the, the primary sovereign or the primary ruler of our lives. And that's not something that has to be taught to us. We just naturally think that way. We act and react as if we are kings or rulers of our own little spheres. Well, because we're limited individuals, and we live in a big world, one other dynamic related to that is we elect for ourselves leaders. And in our country, in a democratic republic, we elect certain leaders. Of course, we're all thinking about that this time of year. In other cultures, in other nations, people have not been involved in electing those rulers. But nevertheless, 
you see throughout human history, there are always people in leadership. And so part of living in the kingdom of earth or the kingdom of man is being a sovereign in our own little sphere of influence and also submitting ourselves to one degree or another to other human sovereigns and even putting our trust in other human sovereigns. Well, here we have Jesus reminding them there's an alternative. There's another kingdom. There's the kingdom of God. And frankly, what we all need the most is the kingdom of God because all we do is harm ourselves and harm other people within our human kingdoms. I think we've proven that over the course of human history, which is really just a history and a, and a sort of a chronicle of human conflict and destruction. So Jesus is introducing them once again to this concept of the kingdom of heaven as an alternative, the kingdom of God's reign. And he compares it to a wedding feast, which is interesting because when we think of kingdoms of this world, especially when we think of uh, monarchs, single leaders of nations or dictators, we tend to think of those negative stories. And frankly, in one sense, that's all there are, are negative stories because of human oppression and how human leaders take advantage of other people. And, and we think of suffering that goes on as a result of that. But this picture is almost completely different. This is the picture of a party. This is a wedding feast. Uh, weddings are still important in our culture today, probably not as important as they were in the past and not as drawn out as they are in other cultures. In, in Israel, in these days, in ancient, uh, this sort of period, this time period, uh, they, they would have wedding feasts that would go on for like a week, not just one day, not an afternoon, but a week. And people would come from all over and they would eat together and they would have music and celebrate. And it would go on and on and on and on. Well, this is the best possible wedding feast because it's given by a king. So this guy has tons of resources. So this is a, a very uh, luxurious wedding feast, okay? And it highlights here, and you can probably come to this conclusion pretty quickly, this is a representation of God as the king, okay? And God, this is talking about his offer of the kingdom of heaven is like inviting someone to a wedding feast, to a great celebration, a great party. So already God's grace is being highlighted here. His generosity. Where he's going to throw this amazing party and invite people, his subjects, to it. Look at the first group of people mentioned here in verse 3 and following. It says, The king sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. If you stop for a minute, it's saying the king is sending out his slaves or his messengers, and they go to the people already invited, people who are already on the guest list, to say, basically, hey, the wedding it's time. It's, it's now. So come. And it says, at the end of verse 3, they're unwilling to come. Now look at verse 4. Again, he sent out other slaves. So he's persistent in this. He sent out other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat and livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. So now he's even more emphatic. And he's really talking about the incentives here. He's saying, look, this, this is a great party. I've killed my oxen, my livestock, he's basically said, I've killed the fatted calf. I've, I've rolled out the red carpet for you. Everything is ready. This is a picture of generosity and his persistence and his patience, despite the fact they had rejected the initial uh, encounter with the messengers inviting them. They had been unwilling, but he's, he keeps going to them. And it says in verse 5, they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm and another to his business. So some of these people who were on the guest list and knew it was coming, some of them, they just went back to their work, their farms, their business, preoccupied with their earthly, their earthly commitments and their earthly goals and all of that and just kind of ignoring this invitation. Verse 6 says there's another group who seized the slaves, mistreated them, and even killed them, somehow resenting this invitation, clearly rebelling against the king and angry against the king. And then it says, and the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire and said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. 
that these people were not worthy. Now, when we go through these parables, we ask questions like, well, who, who do these people represent? Who are these people? Well, they represent the religious Jews and especially the religious leaders. God was inviting them through Jesus to Jesus, to himself, Another way of saying, inviting people to himself, and they were rejecting him. And some were rejecting because they were preoccupied with other things, not all that impressed, didn't really care, didn't see the appeal of it all. Others were rejecting because of hostility. And this, of course, represents the, the Jewish religious people who over the centuries had killed and mistreated God's prophets and even still are mistreating God's messengers like John the Baptist and and even the rejection of Jesus is a manifestation of this. So this represents that community of people who have, by and large, rejected God. And God says, as a result of that, there will be consequences. And he says he sent his armies and destroyed those murders. They mistreated his servants, even killed his servants. And he said there are consequences and go and basically set their city on fire, destroy everything. And this is probably a foreshadowing or a prophecy of what would happen later in 70 AD when the Roman army came in and destroyed Jerusalem, not leaving one stone upon another and killing, some historical estimates say, killing as many as a million people, just a complete slaughter. And God allowed that to happen, and God even had plans for that to happen as an expression of judgment. Judgment not because his people had sin in their lives, but judgment because they were over and over and over again rejecting his gracious invitations. So when he says, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy, again, it's not because they had sin in their lives. It's not even because they were hypocrites, which we know they were. It's because... They refused the invitation. They spurned God's gracious offer of himself, even though it was a perpetual offer and there was great patience. They kept rejecting and rejecting and rejecting. And eventually God says, well, then have it your own way. If you choose the kingdoms of this world, this is what it will look like. And he gives them over to be destroyed by the Roman army in 70 A.D. So that's the first part of the parable, but there's another group of people. Notice it says in verse 9, he says to the remaining servants, go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding feast. Well, go invite other people. We have this feast prepared. We have all this food ready. There's great celebration. Go and invite other people. Go out there in the highways and byways and find anybody you can find and tell them to come. And it says in verse 10, those slaves went out in the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with their dinner guests. It's interesting. It says both evil and good. It, it could be translated both bad and good. And what this means is basically indiscriminately just go and invite whoever you see. And when it says that they were to go out into the main highways, what that probably means is go out there into the all the different uh, intersections and all the different places and, and even... Uh, go out there to the poor and to everybody. You think of think of this for a minute. When if you're if you're throwing a big party, and some of you have been involved in planning a wedding, uh, you're selective in terms of who you invite, right? And you're going to start with probably family members, and then the closest friends. You're going to prioritize. Well, this is like just opening up the gates and saying everyone now can come. Okay, and in, and in one sense. We could dig into this further, but God's inviting even those who we know are hostile toward him because we know all people are rebels, and he's inviting rebels. He's inviting, in a sense, his enemies, which doesn't humanly make any sense. We would never do that. If we're throwing a party, we're spending a lot of money, we're going to have a select few that we want to invite, and they're going to be our closest family members and friends, and God is not like us. He is generous and gracious and amazing, even liberal with his generosity, and says, just go and find anybody. And, and when it says good and bad or good and evil, it's basically saying that the people that are obviously on, on the, the bad side of the tracks and the people who are on the better side of the tracks, just go out there and invite all of them. And this, of course, is a picture of God who says, 
Well, if my people reject me, then I'm using that rejection. And the book of Romans explains this, that God uses the rejection of Israel to provide this amazing opportunity for the rest of the Gentile world to then come to him. He'd always planned to invite them, but now it involves this rejection of his people, and he uses that as a, as a catalyst to, to invite everybody. And it says that the, the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. So many, many of these people came into the, into the, the party. These were people who accepted the invitation. And third, and we're going to make some applications here in a minute, but third, look at uh, verse 11. This is when the king came in to look over the dinner guests. He saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. And the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, throw him into the outer darkness. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. So this is interesting. Among this second group of people invited, there's this man who has basically snuck in, kind of like a party crasher. He's there, and it says he doesn't have proper clothing. He's not dressed in wedding clothes. It doesn't say this explicitly, but if we follow the logic of this, and he's sending out this invitation to everybody, for the most part, most people were poor and wouldn't have had appropriate clothing for a royal wedding. So the conclusion we can draw from that is the king provided clothing for these people. But this man had the opportunity to accept that clothing, but refused it and went in with his own clothes. And the king, observing that this man doesn't fit in, like one of these kids is not like the others, what's the deal here, observes this guy is wearing his own clothes still, clothes that don't fit with a wedding ceremony for a king, with royalty, and it says he kicks him out because of the, uh, the audacity of this man to come in and try to fit in and basically to be a wedding crasher. And he says there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, a picture of being turned over, being excluded. So here's the question. Why, why is this man kicked out? Well, it's basically the same thing Jesus was teaching in the beginning of the parable in terms of why he dealt with the Jewish people the way he dealt with them. It, it's not because there was sin in his life. It's not because he didn't have enough money to be worthy of going to a royal party. It's because he insisted upon going in his own clothing, going as he was and not accepting the gift. Not, in one sense, we could say, not responding appropriately to the invitation. What is the appropriate response? Just to come. To come as you are and to be clothed with the king's clothing. I want you to, if you have your Bible in front of you, turn back to Isaiah 61. There's a section here in Isaiah which fits perfectly as its wedding imagery. And I want you to look at it if you have it in front of you. And I'll read it. It says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. This is a picture of God clothing his people, saving them, clothing them in righteousness. Now coming back to Matthew 22, there's the question here of, worthiness. I mean, who's worthy to attend this party? And in one sense, we could say, well, nobody's worthy to attend this kind of party. Certainly not the Gentiles and the poor and the riffraff from all around the area. Certainly they are not worthy. And yet this generous king not only puts forth all the, the resources to have this party, but also provides the clothing for this party. And the only thing that makes a person unworthy really, though, is rejection of grace. 
Rejection either of the invitation as per the first group we looked at or rejection of the clothing that makes a person fit for that environment, which is a picture of God's gift of righteousness. You remember back in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not have any part in the kingdom. You've got to be better than them. If, it, if you're going to earn it on your own merits, you've got to be better than they are. And they are, by all appearances, the best of the best. He was preparing people back then, and he's getting at the same thing right here. You need the clothing of God around you. You need God to wrap you in his righteousness. And this great celebration and this great party and the enjoyment of it is dependent upon your willingness to come with with nothing, to come with nothing to offer him, to, to come saying, you know what, my own clothing, the clothing of my righteousness, the clothing of my independent way of thinking, my incessant ways of trying to justify myself, I, I reject that, God, and I accept your covering. I'm willing to say, God, you alone can make me right, and Jesus is the provision for that rightness. I think sometimes the term righteousness can be confusing because it's such a theological word and sometimes it seems so detached from the reality of our lives. But what this is getting at is, on whose two feet are you standing? Whose clothing are you coming in? Your own or that of another? The clothing of the king, namely Christ himself, who is the embodiment of that idea of the gift of righteousness. Christ righteousness. And so this man who, who came and insisted on coming on his own merits, God says he's, he's rejected, he's excluded. And the same of those people who rejected because of their preoccupation with this world and they didn't have any interest in the things of God. And that was either boring to them or unhelpful to them. That too, a rejection of, of grace. So this passage introduces us once again to the idea of God's judgment, which is, which is hard sometimes to harmonize with the love and mercy and compassion of God. But when we understand it as the alternative, when humans in their pride and arrogance reject the gift and insist upon justifying themselves and insist upon being their own king, it does make sense that God would then turn them over to the kingdoms of this world. And the only outcome of the kingdoms of this world is death and destruction and misery and suffering. In contrast to life and abundance and joy and even partying that's represented by the imagery of the wedding feast. <laughs> Do you see how it's this gracious offer of God to rescue us from ourselves and the mess we make and to make every provision and the only thing that can exclude you or, or count you unworthy is a rejection of that full provision. That's it. I think there are times when all of us feel that we're not worthy. How could this be? We, we look at our lives and either the past or even the present of what we're going through and what we're thinking and the, the struggles we have and the darkness that we wrestle with at deep levels of our hearts and, and think, how could it be that God can have anything to do with me? And this is one more reminder that, look, because of Christ's righteousness and that clothing covering you, God has everything to do with you. He wants to celebrate with you. Remember that picture? He just sent the servants over and over and over, and he even said, hey, here's the incentive. I've already, I'm, this is a great party. I've got all this food ready for you to come and eat and enjoy. It's the, it's the, the manifestation of or the picture of God's desire for all to come to him. And then it ends with this, this theological point which challenges the limitations of our human thinking, but he says, for many are called, but few are chosen. Just a way of making it clear to the religious leaders in his day and to us today that at the end of it all is the choice of God. And that's, we can't take credit even for our being at the wedding feast. Many are called, few are chosen. It's to do with the choice of God that we see all throughout Scripture. Not because of anything in us that's worthy inherently, but rather because of the kindness of the King who draws us to Himself 
and invites us to himself. And I, I think of um, the concept of, of worthiness, and I just want to close with this. It, this topic comes up a lot in our culture. You hear about it all the time, people talking about self-worth and things like that. I read a quote recently. I shared this in Sunday school. I'll read it again here by a, a woman named Hannah Brencher. She's a, a TED Talk speaker and writer. And she said this, and it kind of went viral on, on Facebook. She said, the best gift you will ever give someone is the permission to feel safe in their own skin, to feel worthy, to feel like they are enough. It relates to that basic human desire to feel accepted and to feel worthy. But we have this conundrum, this problem, that along with this desire to feel worthy and to feel accepted by other people, there's also this incessant desire to prove our worth. And we will never be able to prove our worth or prove our worthiness enough. There will always be the questions of our own minds and the questions and the criticism of other people. There is no good outcome with that approach. There will never be enough acceptance on a human level. And it is one more indicator how much we need God, our creator, and how he says, hey, look, I'm giving you the gift of worthiness. And the only thing that makes you unworthy is your rejection of that gift. And God says, come as you are and receive the clothing of my righteousness, my rightness. In this world and even in our own minds, there's this non-stop craving to prove or to justify ourselves, to make ourselves right, to prove ourselves right. And that I mean, that relates to the, the arguments we have with our spouses and kids and, and all this justification stuff. Meanwhile, we have a God who offers us freely the gift of justification, the gift of worthiness to finally and fully scratch that itch of self-worth that every human here has. His provision is the only sufficient provision for that. The human desire to be included. You've probably been in a situation where there's been a party going on, you know about it, and you've not been invited to it, and you feel excluded, and you don't like the way that feels. And we, we magnify the importance of these human events and these human associations, and we minimize our association with God through Jesus, who says, I've invited you to the greatest possible party you could ever imagine. And there are tastes of it here, and there's going to be an amazing fulfillment of it in the future when we're home. And he reminds us over and over and over again that we're included and that we're accepted and that we're loved and that we are worth something to him. And, and even that part of us that is rebellious and ugly and dark and destructive, our sin, even that he has covered and forgiven so that we might be fully accepted and part of his family, his inner circle and to enjoy the celebration and to, to be able to delight in for the rest of our existence that our Creator has loved us, and has rescued us, has redeemed us. So this is one more reminder of that. One more good reminder, and I hope that's encouraging to you as it has been to me. Would you pray with me as we close here? God, thank you for this parable and the, the clarity of it, the relatability of it. We can all understand these images, even though the culture is different now from what it was then. Lord, our temptation constantly is to, is to minimize the value of what you've done for us through Christ. Our temptation is to constantly try to justify ourselves and prove our own worth, and we do it in so many different ways. We do it in so many different circles in our lives. We even do it in the church. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be freed from, from that poisonous part of our own godless thinking. 
help our minds to be more and more open to and more and more thankful for what you've provided through Christ. Help us to be more compelled by the, the gift of righteousness and to, to, to treasure that and to, to hold tightly to that even as we struggle throughout our lives with the constant manifestations of unrighteousness in our hearts and minds and our flesh. God, we ask that you make this more and more real to us and help us to see how kind you've been and help us to, to look forward to to long for that celebration when not only are we invited to the wedding, but when we ourselves participate in the wedding, when we are fully and finally bonded to your son, married to him forever, to be united forever, freed from sin, and finally made fully alive so, God, we look forward to that day. In the meantime, help us to continue encouraging each other along the way, to keep reminding each other of what is true. And, and thank you for the opportunity we have here as a church body and as a family to do that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.